Uh, they were doing something new. If you notice, your notes are not are already filled out for you. Oh, it's not even working. The reason is, the reason is we there's a lot of stuff we need to go over, and we need to finish it by today. Um, you can take whatever notes that you want on that piece of paper. At the end, we do have a quiz. Can we use a note for the quiz? Sure. For the quiz? Sorry. It's about yesterday. No, because I don't want you using that on your quiz. All right. Let's talk about the media. The media is the last linkage institution we're going to be talking about today. Um, or your other linkage institutions that we've talked about already. The four main ones, one of them is the media, what's the other ones? Interest groups. Interest groups. Interest groups. Uh, public. Elections and? What did we talk about before? Interest groups. Uh, uh, oh, when they're already like the... Uh, incompetent. incompetent. <laughs> That's All right. Oh, we have elections. You communicate your preferences to government by voting. You also have interest groups. You can communicate your preference to government by joining a group and working to get that goal accomplished. We also have political parties that would be your other um, linkage institutions. So there's four main ones. This will be the last one. The media communicates our preferences to the government with the uh, <coughs> programs that they show, with the articles that they write. The government knows what the people want. But the media also allows the government uh, to, uh, to deliver its messages to the American people also. If Donald Trump wants something to be delivered to American people, he can go in front of television and he can communicate that. So it's a two-way street when it comes to the media. Not only can we communicate our preferences to the government using the media, government can also communicate messages through the media to the American people. Anybody have any questions? All right. The way that we have consumed information and media has changed drastically over the years. The way that my generation used to consume media is different from the way your generation is going to be consuming media. In the beginning of our democracy, there was only one form of media in which people can inform the American people. What is that? TV. Newspapers. French media was the first one. This is. Uh, a newspaper from the 1800s, and if you notice, there's really no difference to the newspapers that you see today. Less advertising, but um, it pretty, looks pretty much the same way. This is the most powerful way to reach the people back then. This was the only way to reach the people back then. This is one way where you can communicate your, your goals and affect public opinion. The Fellows Papers that we talk about in this class, they were published in newspapers. This was the main way politicians like Madison and Hamilton can inform the American people and in a way um, change public opinion in the United States. With the Federal's papers, using the newspapers, Hamilton and Madison were hoping to change public opinion about what? Constitution. About the U.S. Constitution of the United States. And that's what the newspaper was used for. Not just to inform, but to change public opinion. But then the 1900s comes along. And we get the invention of the radio in the 1930s. We get the invention of the television. And there is now a media that can reach a wider audience in the United States. And as a result, news adapted to that. News and politicians adapted to the rise in television and in the radio as well. Now there's a way to reach a lot of people in a very efficient manner newspapers and radio. What did Franklin Roosevelt do during World War II and the Depression? He had fireside chats on the radio. This right here is the first time um, presidential candidates had a debate on television. This is the Nixon-Kennedy debate. And the weird thing about this is people that heard the debate on the radio, they thought Nixon won this debate. He had better ideas and he was able to communicate them through the radio better. But people who watched it on TV, for some reason, thought Kennedy won. And it goes to show you how important appearances are nowadays because of television. Um, because a lot of people saw Nixon sweating, he wasn't shaved very well, JFK is really handsome, that didn't hurt. Because a lot of people thought that he was, he was a better debater. So it changed the way how news was delivered to the American people. And by the 1990s, 
by the late 1900s, TV became the primary form of information, source of information for people. It replaced newspapers as the main source of information. So you have people like Walter Cronkite in the evening news delivering information to the American people and be this became the number one way. This is how my generation used to consume the news. We used to consume information, television. And then in the late eight, 1980s, we have the rise of cable news networks. Anybody know which one's the first one? See the Fox News. CNN is the first one. CNN was, I think, in 1989. It was found in 1989. And their idea was revolutionary back then, the idea of 24-hour news, 24-hour news. Back then, when you wanted to hear about the news, you have to wake up early morning, or you have to see it late at night. CNN changed everything, or you have it. You have stations delivering the news as it happens. If something happens at 2 a.m. in the morning, CNN can go ahead and cover that story. All right, and then in your generation, by the late 1990s, and now the 2000s, the 21st century, we have the internet and social media. We have new forms of sources of information now. We have websites, we have blogs, we have social media that can communicate information to the people. The way we absorb information, the way we consume information drastically changed. We have so many choices now. YouTube videos that talk about news. So there's many different ways we can absorb information now. Let's move on. Media's impact on public policy. The media plays the following role. And it might be a good idea to write this down. Gatekeeping. Gatekeeping. The media is known as the gatekeeper of information. And with that job, they can affect public opinion and the policy agenda of government drastically. All right. So here's what gatekeeping means, guys. I need you to pay attention because this might be on your AP exam. Gatekeeping means that the media has a choice on which stories to cover and which stories not to cover. And with that choice, they can affect which issues the American people see as important. If they cover a story a lot, the American people are gonna be aware of that issue and they're gonna think that it's more what? It's more important. Forcing who to put it on their agenda? The politicians. Putting it on which agenda? Talked about this before. People have concerns. They communicate those concerns through linkage institutions. And if enough people are concerned about that something, it gets put on the policy, the, agenda. The policy agenda, and government is, is going to make a policy out of it. So the media has a big role in this. The more they cover a story, the more they cover an issue, the more important people think that issue is, because the more aware they are of that issue. Forcing the government to put that issue onto their policy agenda and forcing the government to make policy out of that issue. The media chooses which issues are going to be put on the policy agenda. Which issues the government is ultimately going to be forced to respond to. So I'll give you an example. Let's say we have two issues right here. We have AIDS and child poverty in the United States. Two problems in the United States. If the media focuses a lot of their time on AIDS, covering AIDS, but not so much on child poverty, which one of these is going to be more likely to be put on the policy agenda? AIDS. AIDS. Because people are going to think it's more what? Important. It's more important. Forcing who to put it on their agenda? The politicians. the politicians, the government, to put it on their policy agenda, forcing them to respond. So which one of these is going to be more likely fixed by the government? AIDS. AIDS. Does that make sense? Anybody confused by gatekeeping? and the agenda setting function. The media's choice to cover a story and not cover a story affects the likelihood of that issue being put on the policy agenda. That's what gatekeeping means. They decide what becomes important to you. They decide what, are you, or how, what issues are they gonna bring attention to or bring awareness to. There are some issues right now facing this country that don't get dealt with because the media doesn't cover it. All right, second function the media does is watchdog function. The media is known as the fourth estate. 
because just like the other branches of government, they have the ability to check government. The watchdog function. This refers to the media's um, propensity, this refers to the media trying to expose who? The government. Trying to expose corruption, trying to expose ignorance in government. This is the watchdog function. They're holding government accountable by seeking to expose corruption, by seeking to expose ignorance within government, they're holding our politicians accountable. As a politician, I'm less likely to do bad things because I know the media plays this function. If I do a bad thing, the media is going to try to uncover that. This is called the watchdog function. Anybody have any questions what the watchdog function means? It is the media trying to expose politicians, government, for corruption and for their ignorance. This is usually done through a method in journalism called investigative journalism. Investigative journalism is using detective-like skills to uncover corruption, to uncover ignorance in government. And this is what a lot of honest journalists right now are doing in the United States, trying to uncover corruption wherever it exists, using detective-like skills to be able to expose government officials for wrongdoings, to hold them accountable for what happens in government. So there's a couple of examples that we talked about in this class. It was the media who helped Edward Snowden expose the United States activities and their collection of our metadata. It was the media that exposed Watergate. These two people right here, Bob Woodward, forgot the other guy's name. There's a movie about them, All the President's Men. These are the people that brought down a president. They're the ones that exposed what? This is, they're the ones that exposed the Watergate scandal. They exposed a government secret. And they brought down the presidency because of it. We have the Pentagon Papers. We talked about the Pentagon Papers here. It was, it was done through the media. It was exposed through the media. All right. The importance of investigative journalism and the watchdog function is, how does it affect the American people? Because of investigative journalism, because of watchdog function, the media has uncovered plenty of corruption. They have, they have exposed plenty of politicians in the United States. And as a result, the American public is now more what? Aware. Aware. We're now more cynical and distrustful of who? Government. government. We're now more cynical and distrustful of government than ever before. If you look at the polls right now, not a lot of people trust their government anymore. And that is the result of the media playing this function, of holding our politicians accountable for what they're doing. Make sense? Yes. All right, next one. It's not all good. Next one is the horse race journalism. And this you're going to see in 2020 as we get closer to the election. You guys are going to be sophomores in college, or some of you do. <laughs> and you're going to see the media doing this a lot. Um, horse race journalism refers to the fact that during elections, the media likes to cover the race. They don't cover the issues. They don't cover the political stances of each candidate, or they pay little attention to that. What they focus on are, are who's winning and losing, poll numbers, the campaign strategies. They cover the game. They don't cover the stances, the issues that are important to the voters. But you can't put the blame on them. It's because this is what we want to watch, because this is something that's exciting for a lot of American people. Looking at poll numbers, how they go up and down, looking at who's leading and who's losing, that's what horse race journalism is. During elections, the media has a tendency to cover who's winning or losing, to cover poll numbers, who's ahead in the polls, who's behind in the polls, and campaign strategies. That's what they like to do. And they spend little attention on covering the issues that are important to the American voter and the platforms of each one of the candidates. The media has a very honorable role in the United States, and that is to inform the American voter. 
The thing that I put on the top of your notes is there is nothing more important to a democracy than a well-informed electorate, a well-informed voting population. And it is used to be the job of the media to inform the American public about the issues, about the candidates, so that when they go to the voting booth, they have knowledge and they have um, they're aware of who should they vote for based on that information. But horse race journalism stops that. Because the media has a tendency of covering who's winning or losing, the poll numbers, the campaign strategies, instead of the issues, instead of the candidate stances. As a result, when you go to the voting booth, when Americans go to the voting booth, it's like you guys go into your pre-cal test. You're clueless. <laughs> who to hey, vote for. That's true. So the electorate is less informed nowadays because of horse race journalism. The voting population of the United States, they just pick their party usually and they don't account for the platform of each one of the candidates. And elections, instead of being about the platforms, instead of being about experience and qualifications of the candidates, elections nowadays are about popularity. Who's ahead in the polls, who's behind in the polls, that's what elections are nowadays. In 2020, most of you are going to be turning into the news. And I want you to remember this day, because this is what they do. They cover who's winning, they cover poll numbers, who's ahead, who has the African American vote, who has the white vote. They cover the game. And they don't give us and provide us the information that we need to make an informed decision. The issues, the political stances, the platforms, are usually ignored, they don't really give a lot of time to them. So elections are about how popular a candidate is instead of, about, instead of about his stances, his platforms, or his qualifications. And believe it or not, this affects the outcome of an election. We talked about the bandwagon effect here because the media has a tendency of showing poll numbers. If someone is ahead in the polls, that gives his campaign momentum and that makes it more likely for what? for voters to support him. Because people like to support a winner. So this is called the bandwagon effect. And it affects elections a lot. So today, people are voting not because of the platform, because we don't know the candidate's platform, not because of their experience and qualification. Voters are voting based on popularity because that's what the media shows them. Who's winning, who's ahead, and good candidates that should be elected are not elected into office because of this. Because it becomes a popularity contest instead of a contest about ideas, about performance. Anyone have any questions? That's the horse race function. The debates in the United States today and the level of our political knowledge is um, affected by the following things. Number one. We have an increase in media sources more than any year ever. The US right now, Americans have access to all kinds of information and all sources of information today. Not only do you have the traditional forms of media, print, TV, radio, but you also have the internet, social media, websites to get your information from. Sources of information is more diverse than ever before. Some people think that the media is more diverse than ever before because we can get me we can get the news from anywhere you can get it from your TV you can get it from Facebook you can get it from reddit you can get it from all kinds of sites so sources of media becomes very diverse today an ordinary person like you can become a journalist with a smartphone if you record something that's happening, that's already news. And you post it on YouTube, that's already news. So anybody can become a journalist. There's going to be a problem with that. We'll talk about the problem with that later on. But the sources of information nowadays is more than ever before. It's more diverse than ever before. But some argue that even though we have more sources of information than ever before, media has become increasingly less diverse I'm going to show you something scary in a little bit, but this happens a lot. So there's schools, two schools of thought. Some people argue that media is more diverse than ever before because we have more sources of information. 
many different websites, thousands of websites, thousands of TV channels that you can um, turn into to get your information about politics. But in reality, some people argue, a lot of these companies, these TV companies, these newspaper companies, and these websites are owned by only a few companies. If you look at the actual statistics, a lot of our TV networks, a lot of our radios, uh, networks, a lot of our print networks are owned by only six companies. Because back in the 1900s, the early 1900s, a lot of these newspapers and television networks, they were consolidated and they were bought out by huge companies. So today, as a result, you only have a few companies, large companies, owning most of our media. What happened last year with Disney? Anybody know? They bought out. 20th Century Fox. Again, a lot of these are being consolidated into big companies. We call these media conglomerates, giant media conglomerates. And in reality, there's only six companies that own everything. And there's drastic consequences to that. Giant media conglomerates. So what's the consequences of that? News coverage nowadays has become very similar. They talk about the same thing, they present it the same way, because they're all owned by the same company. So <coughs> news coverage has become, what's that word in science? Homogeneous? It's yeah. Yeah. Homogeneous? It's become very, very similar. And the opinions that are presented in our news media, according to some people, have become less diverse because of it. Because there are only six companies controlling information. All of these guys are saying the same things. All the media is saying the same things. Opinions are less diverse. The opinions that are being presented are less diverse. And the scary thing is, you have these huge companies owning everything, so they can control what information gets broadcasted on TV and radio? What information you get? And by controlling information, you can also control what? Control Elections. Opinion. You can control public opinion. The fact that these large companies right here, like Viacom and Disney, control everything, means they can control the information that gets to you. And by controlling that information, they can control public opinion. So all that alternate future that you guys see on, on movies and stuff like that of huge companies controlling information, that's actually happening nowadays. So I'll show you a video that shows this in a dramatic way. These are local Fox News TV um, shows. Um, and you'll see Oh, also, I want you to notice the irony. Hi, I'm Fox San Antonio's Jessica Headley. And I'm Ryan Wolf. Our, our greatest, greatest responsibility, responsibility is to serve our Treasure Valley communities, the El Paso Las Cruces communities, Eastern Iowa communities, Mid Michigan communities. We are extremely proud of the quality, balanced journalism that CBS4 News produces. Yes. Yes. But we are concerned about the whole country. Plaguing our country. Plaguing our country. The sharing of bias and false news has become all too common on social media. More alarming, some media outlets publish these same fake stories without checking facts first. The sharing of biased and false, false news, news has become, become all too common on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media outlets publish these same fake stories without checking facts first. Unfortunately, some members of the media believe that black platforms are to share their own personal bias and an agenda to control exactly what they will think. And this, this is, is extremely dangerous, dangerous to our democracy. This is extremely 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 dangerous to our democracy. Uh, this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 
This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. But the irony is they're criticizing other forms of media and how it's a threat to democracy, but they're all saying the same things because they're just a mouthpiece for these large companies that own them. So by controlling the information, they can control public opinion also. All right, next. Money and the media, how money affects what gets shown on TV. All right, so you should know most of our news networks in the United States, they have one goal, and that goal, their businesses, and that goal is to make profit. How do TV shows and radio, how do they earn profit? Make good TV shows. Even internet. Making good, why do they want to make a good TV show? So people can, people can watch, so that they can sell what? How do they, how do they earn money? By ads. The higher the ratings, they, the more ads they can sell during their show. Advertising is what gives them the money. And in order to sell that advertising to companies, they need to be able to have a huge um, viewership. The more people that watch a show, the higher the rating the show is, the more money you can charge for advertising. If you're the Big Bang Theory, for example, you're, you're very popular, you can charge a lot of money um, for companies to show advertising during your show. Make sense? Now, a lot of people think that this affects how the news covers stories and how the news presents information here in the United States. Because news is in the same business as SpongeBob and the Jersey Shore. They need to get ratings. And it's not their fault. This is the way things are. They're a business. They need to survive. So how does this affect how they cover the news? Today, a lot of people accuse the news of being biased, liberal bias, conservative bias. Sure, some news are very biased, but all, most all news networks are biased for one thing. They're biased towards entertainment. They want to, because what's their goal? To get the most what? To get the most ratings, to get the most people watching. And what's the problem with that? Because given a choice between an entertaining story and a useful story, which one would they choose to cover? The entertaining one. And some opinions here in the United States, the moderate opinions in the United States, are very, very boring. The, the exciting opinions are the ones that get shown on TV, but those are usually the more extreme opinions. So the media is very much biased towards entertainment, conflict, sensationalism. If you look at CNN, I guarantee you, 20 minutes of watching, you're going to see people shouting at each other. Because that's what we like to watch. Uh, and sometimes the media is biased towards fairness because of this. What does that mean? Biased towards fairness. That sounds like a contradiction. It's not. The media likes to present both sides of the story. The problem with that is sometimes a story doesn't have both sides. Oh. Sometimes a story only has one side, the truth. Like, for example, climate change. In the United States, 97% Actually, in the world, 97% of all scientific journals supports the fact that climate change is happening and it's man-made. So in the scientific community, climate change is already a done deal. It's an established thing that's happening right now in the U.S. But if you look at the polls in the United States today, one in four Americans think climate change is not happening, including the President of the United States. So what's the reason for that? Because when you look at CNN and when you look at Fox News, whenever they're talking about climate change, what do you see? You see a split screen. One person for, one person against. And in, 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 in TV, it's 50-50. It's like there's still a debate going on. And that's misleading to the American people because they feel like there's, they can question climate change also because on TV, it's 50-50. And that's because they thrive with sensationalism, they thrive with conflict, that's how they get the views. So I'll give you a, uh, uh, an example of this. In 2013, I'm oh, sorry, this was, yes, 2013. In the summer of 2013, um, there was this big story that broke out. Um, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It was gonna be a trade deal the United States was going to make with the Asian countries around the Pacific 
It's going to lower the trade barriers that's going to allow us to freely trade. But this is going to affect businesses here at home. It may mean loss of jobs. It may mean gain of jobs. But it has real life consequences. So Obama was in the process of negotiating TPP. But at the same time that story breaks out, another story breaks out about a former House of Representative member named, I'll tell you the name later on. He was sending um, pictures of his junk to someone who is not his wife. And ironically, his name is Anthony Weiner. <laughs> In the grand scheme of things, whoever he sends his junk to doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect us. But who did the news decide to dedicate their time to? And they didn't talk about this story a lot. And we talk about gatekeeping in this class. The more they talk about a story, the more we feel that that story is what? More important. And that the more likely it gets put on the government's policy agenda. But they didn't give this story importance. Because the media's biased towards what's entertaining, they're biased towards conflict, they're biased towards sensationalism. Given a useful story and an entertaining story, they would almost certainly cover the entertaining one because that's what we like to watch. Anybody have any questions? I know I feel like I'm harping on the media too much, but the thing is, this is your fault. If you're looking for somebody to blame, it's you. Because if you're honest with yourself, which one would you rather watch? I would watch that. You can see where it is. all the time. Wait, so what happened with that? The TPP, did it pass? It did, but I think it's like weekend. All right, next, number four. The rise of partisan media. Today, media is tailored, a lot of media today is tailored towards uh, an ideological perspective. When they present the information, when they present the news, they present it in an ideological lens, through an ideological lens or a partisan lens. So which means the news has a certain ideological slant or bias. Anybody know who started this? So mostly traditional media, they know this is the distribution of American beliefs. You have extremely liberals here, extremely conservatives, but most Americans are actually what? Moderate. They're actually pretty moderate, sometimes leaning left, sometimes leaning right, but most of us are pretty moderate. So before, uh, news media try to get as much of their audience as possible by being honest, by presenting the facts, the, by being objective. They think if they're the best news network, then people are going to gravitate towards them. They're dead wrong. In 1996, Fox News is going to prove them wrong. So what Fox News does in 1996 is, instead of aiming to be objective, instead of aiming to, um, to present the best news possible in a very objective way, they, they decided to get the most audience by catering to a certain population. But they decided, we're not going to try to get everybody we're going to get here. We're going to get the right. So they tailored their programming towards which ideology? Conservatives. And here are the results. Consistently, Fox News is ahead in the ratings. Because Fox News figured out something that other networks are going to figure out later on. That we don't really want the news. What we want is for people to confirm what we already believe in, for people to agree with us. That's what we actually want. Conservatives watch Fox News because it reaffirms their beliefs. It confirms what they already believe in. And that's got what's gotten them in the ratings, ahead in the ratings. And MSNBC, CNN are going to copy that model, but they're going to gear their, their um, programming toward two. Towards liberals, they're not going to be as effective as Fox News, Fox News, but that's what most media does today. So, Fox News is more conservative. They have a little a conservative slant when they're talking about information, and MSNBC and CNN have a very um, liberal slant. Anybody know? Have you ever seen Huffington Post before? Yeah. It's a website um, where bloggers can post articles. Um, they're very liberal. 
anybody heard of Breitbart before? It's a website. It's tailored towards conservatives. Is that why Trump likes Fox and Friends? Yes. So why? Because we like to watch things that confirm our beliefs. And this is just natural human nature. All right. So here's what happens because media nowadays is partisan and ideological. The result is, if the media is going to be more ideological, more partisan, more divided, who's also going to be more divided? The people. The result of the partisanship of the news today and the bias in the news today is the polarization of the United States. We are more divided than ever before since the Civil War. According to poll numbers, we haven't been this divided in this country. Liberals and conservatives in this country haven't been so divided since the Civil War. And they actually had a war to fix that, which is scary. Why? Number one, we are not presented with objective facts. We're presented with information that's filtered through an ideological lens. We're presented in a way that conservatives would agree with it or liberals would agree with it. And our country, these news media today has become an echo chamber. What does that mean? The same thing over and over. The same thing over and over again. And they're not presenting the other side of the argument. So when they're talking about an issue, they would prop up the conservative side of an argument, Fox News will, while not talking about the liberal side of that <coughs> argument. And if you're a conservative watching Fox News, you believe you're right because you're not presented with the other side of the argument. Same thing for MSNBC and CNN, you're not presented with the other side. And when they do present you with the other side, they're not giving you the best form of that argument. So I'll give you an example. Fox News at one time, they were talking about um, welfare. Are conservatives for limiting or expanding welfare in the United States? They want to limit welfare. Um, so they brought in this guy. He's like a white guy um, that spends his welfare money on cell phones, spends his welfare money on cars. To, But that's not the best version of the argument. He's by far the exception to the rule. There's a lot of people that need these welfare benefits to survive but they're presenting you with an exception to the rule. That's not the best version of the argument. And if you're a conservative looking at that, that just reaffirms your belief because you don't see the other side. They do the same thing in CNN and they do the same thing in MSNBC. They don't give you the best form of the argument from the other side. And as a result, it's an echo chamber. You just see things that you already agree with and that confirms your beliefs and makes your beliefs stronger. They're overly critical of the other side. They, they tend to demonize the other side. Anybody remember this happening when Obama was president? This was in Fox News. Um, Obama went to a tour of other countries because he's a chief diplomat. So he went through other countries. And in some countries, like in Japan, for example, he would bow down to the head of state. In Fox News, they spend like hours on that, criticizing president for bowing down to other people. Because apparently that makes us look what? Weak. That makes us look weak. It's us bound. Now that's something that's not related at all to anything, but they're overly critical of the other side. Same thing for MSNBC and same thing for CNN right now with Trump probably. They're overcritical of the other side. And, and as a result, what's happening to the United States, we're becoming more what? Divided. More divided. Because we don't see the other side. We don't see common ground uh, with the other side anymore. So hostile. All right. And today, guys, we are not just presented with information like your grandparents were presented with information. We get to choose information. If you're a liberal, what, what are you going to probably watch? CNN. You're going to watch CNN. You're not going to watch Fox News. You're going to watch CNN. If you're a conservative, you're going to watch Fox News. You get to choose your facts today, which is inherently wrong. You should be presented with the facts, not be able to choose it. Anybody have any questions? Moving on, so we've become more polarized in the United States. Look at ideologies in the United States over time. And one of the reasons for this is the media becoming more ideological as well. All of this results in the fact that today, 
people do not trust the media any longer. The influence of money, partisanship in the media, we no longer trust the media, especially your generation. What did um, President Trump call the media? A lot of media, fake news. So here's one argument for that. So we talked about how more and more Americans, especially your generation, are getting your, your news from where? Not tra the traditional sources like TV and radio and print. You get it from where? Twitter. The t social media, internet websites. The problem with that is though that information is not as well sourced, it's not as well researched as information that you would get from traditional media. Usually, when TV networks, news networks, um, um, print media, newspapers publishes a story, it's well researched, it's well sourced. They're very, very careful when they're presenting the information. But anybody now can post information on a blog, anybody now can post information on Twitter, and it's not well sourced, it's not well researched. There's, no, there's not a filter anymore for bad information. And as a result, the information that we get nowadays, especially from social media and the internet, may not be as what? As reliable, may not be as trustworthy as other forms of media. And that contributes to this fact that there may be fake news um, that people are, are seeing nowadays. So if you look at this poll, well, what kind of poll is this, by the way? Benchmark for starts? Oh. The tracking poll. It, it looks at the pin over time. Look at your generation and my generation. Over the years, we've become less and less trustful of the media, and even people who are older are also less distrustful of the media. I mean, trust, less trustful of the media. Anyone have any questions? All right, we have homework tonight. Come on, time. Hey, we have enough time. We have time, right? Oh. Oh. Yeah. What time do we leave? 11.10, right? Yeah.